All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started here while folks are filtering in. Um, thanks everyone for being here. My name is Guy and I'm with South Hero Land Trust. Um, this is the uh, second event in our winter webinar, our winter webinar series uh, that we're doing on Wednesdays throughout uh, 2021 winter. Uh, it's a partnership between the Land Trust and the Worthen Library. And um, I'm super excited that we have these great uh, panelists and speakers here tonight. And I'm um, thankful for all of you for being here to engage um, in this discussion. Um, I'll let Molly take it away in a little bit here. Uh, and she'll be our moderator. Um, and uh, Mo Molly comes to us uh, from the Grand Isle County Natural Resources Conservation District. And she has some, up some exciting upcoming projects uh, to share with us going on uh, in our county as well. Um, we also are joined tonight by Mark Nod, uh, who's chair of the Vermont Citizens Advisory Committee on Lake Champlain's future. It's also an environmental and land use attorney and a resident of South Hero. Uh, and finally, uh, we're also joined by Bob, by Bob Bierman, a farmer resident of South Hero and a, a member of the uh, Northwest Regional Planning Water Advisory Committee. Also, Bob is on the Land Trust Board. So thank you, Bob, for, for all, that you, all that you do. Um, this event series uh, is made possible through the donors and like uh, membership uh, from the Worthen Library and South Hero Land Trust. So thanks to everyone who is a member and a donor. Thank you for your support. Um, we also received a grant um, through the American Libraries Association. So um, thanks to them for funding for this event series. Um, all the events are free. Um, just a quick, uh, quick preview of what's coming up, but um, our next event uh, will be uh, next Wednesday, um, February 24th at 7 p.m. We're joined by uh, Chief Don Stevens, uh, Melody Walker, um, and uh, Jesse Bruchok um, from the Abenaki community, who will be speaking on the importance of land, waters, um, and culture, and some of the perspectives from Abenaki people uh, today. So that one will be really exciting. Hope you all can join us for that. And then we have a couple other events coming up, including a uh, film showing and farmer panel um, on March 10th, and then also a uh, BIPOC and experiences in the outdoors event on March 31st. And we have a few more in the works as well. You can check all that out on our website. You can see over there on the right. Um, oops, jumping ahead. On the right, you can go to our, our website, to check out an RSVP to um, our upcoming events. And uh, before I turn it over to Molly, I'll just say thanks everyone uh, for being here. And um, I think that water quality is of course a very important issue. And um, one of the things that I just want us to remember while we're, while we're talking about this is that, you know, water quality is something that does affect us all and we all do affect water quality. So it's a shared burden, but it's also a shared opportunity. So um, the more we can come together and we can work together, um, I, think, I think that'll do us well. And I think it's gonna really take all of us working together because it's not an easy problem. It's very complicated, but I think that um, there's some really exciting things that we can all do to help. So um, looking forward to the panelists and the discussion. And uh, yeah, Molly, with that, I will, uh, I will make you the host and I'll let you uh, take over um, and stop share. And all right, okay. all you. Oops, sorry. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Okay, great. Um, so. Thank you, Guy, first off, um, and Emily from the South Carolina Land Trust for including me in it tonight's discussion. Um, so we, I think, as Guy sort of mentioned, we want to really make this an engaging and productive conversation, but we're also going to be um, sort of delivering a lot of what we hope is useful information. Um, so we're, we might move pretty quick, but just know that all of our slides um, will be sent out to all of you after this meeting. Um, the first two that I'm gonna just go through really quickly are just resources that we put together that are really based on sort of individual and community action that can be taken to, to protect our water quality. Um, 
And so while it sometimes may seem that the actions of one person may not make much of a difference, I think the little things that we do collectively are, is what's gonna have a huge impact on improving the quality of our environment. Um, and that's really what we chose to focus sort of this list of resources on. So there's simple actions like how to correctly mow your lawn in the most environmental, environmentally friendly way, or you know, larger and sort of more complex actions um, like designing your property be to be stormwater friendly. Um, the great thing about a lot of these resources is that they do point you in the direction of technical and financial resources that you can access um, to help you with some of those more complex um, projects. Um, and so in addition to the sort of the how to's and fact sheets, we also put together a list of sort of just um, an in-depth analysis of how the lake is doing. Um, so there's some great reports out of the Lake Champlain Basin Program, um, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, um, the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy, which specifically talks about um, climate change. Um, so all great resources, um, gives you a little bit of in-depth about what the strategies are that are in place to help us improve water quality, you know, over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Um, sorry, I'm trying to click to the next slide, which doesn't seem to be happening. Oh, sorry, my, it seems like my computer is just a bit slow. Um, so before I hand it over to Mark and Bob, um, I just want to take a quick second to introduce myself beyond um, that I'm with the Grand Isle um, County Natural Resources Conservation District. Um, so for those of you who aren't super familiar with conservation districts, um, there's 14 in Vermont um, and they're governmental subdivisions of Vermont um, and they were created through the Soil Conservation Act of 1939. Um, and so obviously there's been a lot of change since then, but the mission has kind of remained the same. So we're local entities that work within our communities and our local natural resources um, to encourage the responsible use um, of natural resources, the protection, the restoration and conservation of them as well. Water quality obviously being a huge one. Um, and with each district, we look to provide the um, technical assistance, um, the implementation of projects, um, creating edu educational opportunities to really work to get our mission across. Um, so I really wanna speak just briefly about what we hope will be an exciting project coming up. Um, we recently applied for a grant through the Lake Champlain Basin Program um, just about two weeks ago. Um, and the kind of the outline is in this slide, but the goal of it, um, it's focused on South Hero um, and the Keeler Bay shoreline. Um, this idea for the proposal kind of came through a number of different avenues, our conversations with the community. Um, I, we had hosted a water quality webinar in September of 2020. We had a lot of South Hero re residents in attendance. Um, we had some conversations about what the South Hero Planning Commission is doing to address stormwater. Um, and then there's some recommendations that come from state, doc state documents like the Tactical Basin Plan and Lake Champlain Basin Programs Opportunities for Action. Um, and what the plan, what the proposal is, it's going to look for ways of identifying sources of water quality impacts, prioritizing the sources based on various environmental, economic, and social criteria, and designing high ranked projects to mitigate um, sediment and nutrient loading into Lake Champlain, specifically in Tequilar Bay. Um, and we would be doing this by really taking a deep look at the streams and tributaries, wetlands, drainage, di drainage ditches, and the lake shores um, throughout South Hero. Um, and the goal would be to kind of create this, this huge project packet of potentially 20 to 30 sites that would be really well positioned for future funding and implementation um, and creating you know, nine conceptual designs to help sort of get that, get that moving. Um, so it's just, you know, we're just gonna be one sort of piece of the puzzle. Um, but like we said before, there's, you know, all that collective action is really what's gonna make the change. So this is sort of step one um, for us. And while we may not 
we may not know, we won't know um, if we receive the grant until June. Um, I think we built a really strong framework um, and we will definitely try again, um, take any recommendations from the review committee and address them. Um, and hopefully it can serve as a model for the other towns and shorelines within Grand Isle County. Um, and the great part is we will be partnering with um, South Hero Land Trust and Vermont DEC on building out this proposal, um, really weaving in a large educational um, educational aspect to it. So we really want to drive up community involvement. Use you know meetings like this to help help us identify priority areas and projects um, while educating you along the way. So my hope is that we will soon be meeting again um, if we if we get to bring this project to life. Um, so my fingers will be crossed, um, but thank you. And now um, I will hand it over to Mark. I'm gonna stop sharing Mark and make you host. Terrific, thank you. Oh, and sorry, for those that may have joined a little bit later, um, any questions you can field to the question and A section um, or to the chat, I'll sort of be moderating from here on out and then fielding questions um, sort of once we go through the presentations. Okay. Hi, thanks, Guy, and thanks for the introduction, Molly. I'm Mark Nod. I am chair of the Vermont Citizens Advisory Council um, on Lake Champlain's future. It's a um, Vermont-based statutory body of 14 individuals, four representatives, well, two representatives, two senators, and 10 citizens from public at large, uh, appointed by the governor to provide an annual report and advice on management of Lake Champlain, um, in addition to regular meetings to increase awareness of, educate ourselves, and hear citizens' voices related to issues of concern for Lake Champlain. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a minute. My goal is to provide you with a fairly quick overview of some um, context. Um, issues of concern and um, items that might anticipate or stimulate conversations for later. So it's gonna go by fairly quickly. All of these slides are available either on the list of resources from the DEC, the Lation Plain Basin Program or the Vermont CAC link that Molly shared and we'll share with those two resource slides coming up. So let me share my screen and get moving. Okay, can everybody see the screen, my screen now? Okay, terrific. So I wanna start uh, just fairly quickly with context. This is the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, it is novel in that ha it has a remarkably large um, land coverage to surface water cover coverage for your average lake basin, as you can see. I'm going to focus this discussion around the northern lake area or the lake direct, and you can see that it is the islands and we are at the heart of it. We are at the bottom of the basin in the uh, sort of center of the nest, as I like to think about it. Um, these slides are highlights um, from presentations delivered to, to the Vermont CAC recently that are um, previews of reports that will be issued soon from the DEC and uh, in planning and preparation for um, the new Lake Champlain Basin Program uh, State of the Lake, which will be coming out uh, for next year. First, I want to just highlight the State of the Lake report is available. It's 2018. It'll be updated for 2021. Um, well, updated through 2020. And then I'll be using long-term monitoring project data. And it's still being reviewed, but it will um, uh, hint towards some of the previews of issues on the lake. The lake has a number of challenges. The primary focus has been uh, related to nutrient loading, phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, and uh, thus 
most of the energy, most of the money is being focused on, um, as Molly noted, uh, sediment reduction and nutrient reduction. Um, and if you think of it simply, if you see sediments flowing into the lake, it's carrying phosphorus and nutrients and probably other chemicals from, from stormwater runoff. The lake long-term monitoring program has a number of sites on tributaries and throughout the lake. This is a very quick uh, depiction of what it is. Um, they uh, survey for physical, chemical, and biological sampling. It's supported with DEC, partners across the lake in New York, basin program, and they are actually in the process of trying to uh, hire a new leader to continue this work that's been going on since the early 90s. Uh, this image depicts the Lake Champlain total maximum daily load analysis. And really what it shows, and if you look in yellow, that's the Vermont non-wastewater treatment facility load of 606 metric tons of phosphorus per year. The gray is from wastewater treatment plants. I wanted to use this to show you that 69% of the issues affecting Lake Champlain are from Vermont. And that's why our focus has been to carry most of the load of working on solutions. So this slide is again, EPA TMDL, which is you'll hear again and again, and that is the budget. It's the loading budget. If you think about balancing your budget, your checkbook, this is the budget of the estimated load that the lake can take of phosphorus nutrients. And so you can see the dominant impacts of base load are from agriculture, from stream bank erosion, and from developed lands, and then from forest practices. The smallest amount of the, those is from wastewater treatment plants, about 4% the reduction will move to this bottom picture, which is the planned allocation. So we're gonna reduce so that agriculture is at 118 metric tons or about 28% of the load. And as you can see, wastewater treatment plants have an increased load and that's anticipating between now and 2038, which is the extent of the TMDL planning, there will be more of our uh, land use impacts managed through wastewater treatment plants. And again, to focus on our part of the lake, as you can see, these yellow uh, areas of the pie charts are agriculture, and then from stream bank erosion, and uh, red is from developed lands. So you see most of the challenges that are impacting um, the northern part of the lake where we live are from agriculture and stream bank erosion, then developed lands with limited and forested lands. The lake data I want to share with you with this just to show these are trends over the last 20 years in phosphorus. And really what we'd like to see is reading any of those small charts from left to right. You'd like to see the trend line going down and we really aren't seeing it. Um, and so the question is why? If we're spending a lot of money and we're uh, implementing a lot of new practices, why aren't we seeing that uh, downward trend? And one of the primary issues is that there are significant legacy loads of phosphorus within the lake. And imagine after World War II, literally rail car loads full of phosphorus were delivered to farmers all surrounding the lake um, after the uh, uh, war production ended in order to supply uh, fertilizer to maximize yields on farmlands. And we're still dealing with that legacy. Um, and here we are 70 years later. Another relevant report is the Clean Water Initiative Performance Report. Um, I urge you to take a look at it. It's very long, but it's a very, very comprehensive report. I'll highlight this chart that's at the bottom again, but it very quickly shows a depiction of progress we're making. The clear, the white box is the estimated phosphorus reductions on a year to year basis. And then at the end, the target is the total reduction we're seeking. 
And really it's to show you how much work we still have to do. We're making progress, but we have a lot of work to do. Again, more lake data. This is just a focus in on a three year trends. And you can see that we're not seeing significant left to right downward trend that we'd like to see. We're seeing fairly, um, there might be some, some uh, uh, variations year to year, but not in the direction we'd like to see yet. Um, nutrient loads um, tend to impact us most when we have cyanobacteria um, blue-green algae blooms. And I wanted to focus on this, uh, the Lake Champlain Committee and the Depart Department of Environmental Conservation do a remarkable job of um, gathering data for their reporting. Um, and it shows just last year with the Burlington Beach closure days of what a challenging time we had, even with relatively uh, low precipitation, in fact, abnormally low precipitation, um, the high water temperatures and the existing uh, phosphorus triggered a number of algae blooms, including a number um, up here in the Northeast sector. An item of concern that we've been monitoring and you know, you've read about with changes in VTrans is the increased chloride levels throughout the lake, in fact, in every sector. Um, as private um, plow and salting companies catch up and um, smaller towns catch up with brining and alternatives to chloride use, one of the challenges that we've heard from uh, municipalities is that with climate change and the variability that we've had with snow events particularly, if you have a 12 inch dump, um, things get plowed and a relatively small amount of uh, salt is either pre-applied, brine is pre-applied, or, um, or uh, then applied at the end. But if you have over a week, six two inch snowstorms, you're using a lot, a lot of salt for every one of those events. And so it's that variability in our um, weather systems that's uh, one of the trends that's causing this increase that's being monitored. Um, here's just another uh, depiction of our abnormal 2020 year. And it wasn't just COVID except COVID really challenged the opportunities for the long-term monitoring program to get out and do their work um, sampling. It was very limited sampling this year in the first phase of the stay at home order. And then once people figured out how to actually get out and uh, do that work out of doors, um, there were challenges with labs and staffing, uh, et cetera. We're hopeful that this year there will be uh, no or very minimal impact to that continued long-term monitoring. But what you can see is the main lake average temperature has increased significantly um, over four degrees Celsius over the last approximate 20 years. And then if you look at the 2020 temps in the graph to the left, the extremes, um, you can see how we had a number of records um, all the way across the, the year. Again, to note on phosphorus load reductions and our targets, um, this is where the balance between federal, state, and other regulatory programs, as you can see, Vermont is taking on more and more of its responsibility, which is why um, our funding through the legislature has been up to pushing almost $60 million a year. And uh, we think that's the minimum required for federal matching and to actually meet the goals and requirements of the TMDL. And then by land use sector, again, it's primarily agricultural load reductions with changes in agricultural practices, um, stormwater management on developed lands, and, um, and then in natural resource, in forested lands and other stream bank erosion issues, 
and then improved roads. And primarily, most of these reductions are being achieved through changes in practices on our ditching, on our road utilization, on agriculture, and, uh, and then implement, implementing projects that are literally slowing down water and getting it to infiltrate rather than run off into the lake. Again, this is a follow-up on the load reduction from baseline to target and the progress we're making, but the significant required reduction remaining, um, which are the dark blue uh, in, the, uh, in the actual estimates. One of the challenges is that we continue to refine our models and refine the data collection to determine whether or not we're meeting those targets. Most of the reductions for the loads that you see are from estimates based on um, engineered analyses of those practices. But what this shows you is we still have work to do. There's still study and more data gathering to figure out river and flood stain restoration, lakeshore restoration, wetland restor restoration, and then forest erosion controls. Um, we simply don't have the ability to estimate the nutrient pollution reduction from those practices at this time. We know there will be um, improvements by reducing the amount of sediments that are uh, discharged from any of those uh, uh, projects, um, but we're still working on the data to actually narrow down what those successes might look like. I included these uh, short slides just to show you the amount of funding that's been going um, over the last five years into watersheds that impact our region. The Lamoille obviously is a major uh, tributary leading into Mallets Bay and uh, cumulative is a over $11 million. In our Northern direct region, we've got about $30 million. Um, and most of those, as you can see, are either for significant wastewater treatment plant upgrades up in St. Albans Bay um, or agriculture and stormwater. Um, some, as you see in the 2020, are cross-sector, meaning we're really getting out there and uh, investing in a number of different projects. Here are results and outputs. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. It's available in the Clean Water Performance Report. I just wanted to give you uh, an overview of how detailed the data is on breaking apart some of the successes and the, uh, the positive results that these investments have been uh, occurring. Um, I wanted to focus here on the load reductions in our segmented watersheds. I really wanna focus on the highlighted uh, darker green areas. And it shows you that in St. Albans Bay and in our Northeast Arm, we're actually making pretty good progress, right? We're, we're halfway there. Um, however, we've got a lot of work to do and most of our effort is gonna be around uh, stream bank erosion and agricultural uh, conservation practices in, in our region. These are broken down load reductions for various segments. You can see Missiscoy Bay. We've got a lot of work to do between the eight metric tons and the 87, that is our target. Um, next is the Northeast Arm, um, which is the Inland Sea area. Ignore the South Lake. And then you can see St. Albans Bay, which uh, I was just showing again, we're, we're getting about halfway there. One of the other issues that, that we've been focusing on is with the changing conservation practices, um, particularly in um, the dairy industry and uh, using cover crops, which are practices that plant a vegetative cover to overwinter and particularly in between corn plantings, um, but then the practice has been to go through and kill that uh, uh, cover crop before planting the corn. And the chemical of choice is glyphosate, Roundup. And you've, many of you may have heard of Roundup Ready, 
seeds and uh, Monsanto Bayer's um, sort of owning that market for both seed production and then chemicals used on uh, uh, resistant seeds. The trend is what's concerning is that while we've had a lot of phosphorus reduction based on these conservation practices, we're seeing an almost 50% increase approximately of glyphosate um, throughout the region. What's even more concerning is there was an assumption that atrazine, which is a carcinogenic chemical of significant concern, glyphosate has some questions that um, many jurisdictions are seeking to ban glyphosate, but the United States has not moved in that direction. And it is still one of the most widely used herbicides in the world. Um, the trend is, as you can see from the green line, with a recent reduction of corn acres planted in the state um, and the increased utilization of cover crops, there was an expectation that atrazine utilization would go down. And in fact, it's increased. And so the, the combined use, and this is reported from Nat Shambaugh, who was a uh, agency of agriculture chemist, recently retired after 30 years, um, where he took his, the data that he had worked with or is uh, available and uh, had raised this concern with us. A number of other folks were alarmed that uh, we're seeing, while we're getting improvements for nutrient loading, we're getting increased chemical loading. Again, here's the glyphosate statewide usage. There's been significant increased usage of it along railroad rights of ways, um, power line easements, and in forestry. And then this slide uh, depicts and shows you the uh, dramatic use of atrazine um, and not a significant reduction over the last 10 years. The 2020 data is still being compiled. And again, you see that glyphosate has increased dramatic as an herbicide in forestry use. And this is statewide atrazine um, and the uh, uh, shows a fairly static use and not the reduction that we expected. One of the issues that's been uh, brought to our attention relates to um, small watersheds that have high levels and, and relatively high impact of uh, glyphosate, atrazine, and other chemicals of concern beyond the nutrient reduction. Um, an analysis of Jewett Brook, which flows into St. Albans Bay, you can see St. Albans City, um, there's both Stevens and Jewett Brook. Um, it showed, this is from Nat Shambaugh's work also, it showed significant amounts of atrazine and other chemicals flowing through tile drainage um, into Jewett Brook. It's a small watershed. Um, it might be uh, thought about as sort of a canary in the coal mine that if we can do more smaller watershed data collection and analysis, we may be able to have a better handle on how to manage it better more broadly in the lake. Again, this shows that the um, atrazine compounds um, vastly exceeded um, uh, exposure limits um, as recommended by the EPA. Um, any questions people have or to have a greater context of these, all of them are derived from reports that are uh, available at the CAC, Vermont CAC website, um, or within the other resources that were there. Uh, I am going to give this back. Let me give it back to Molly. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> and we got some great questions in, in regards to your presentation, Mark. So we'll be, once um, we hear from Bob, we'll start sort of 
asking the questions that you all are asking. So thank you for submitting them. Okay, Molly, thank you. So um, for those who don't know me, uh, my wife and I, we have a sheep farm off of Kippy Point. It's about 40 sheep right now. So we're in the small or less than small definition from the state, um, but we've been involved in the farm community for generations. What I want to go through is some of the things that we, we can do as residents that are just somewhat simple tasks to do our part to try to reduce any kind of pollution that's going into the lake. Um, the first ones we got here are the residential practices. Some of the easiest things is just making sure your downspouts go out onto a grassy area and they filter before they just run down into a ditch and into the lake. Um, the idea with a healthy lawn is, again, get the, get the rain to work its way down through into the roots, into the ground. You do the same thing with trees and shrubs instead of just wide open land. Uh, using rain barrels, constructing rain gardens, and making sure your septic system is working so it's, it's filtering things the way it's supposed to. Next page, Molly, there we go. Um, now, all those also apply if you're along shoreline, but you can do a little bit more um, from, a, from a driveway standpoint is don't have a lot of gravel. Don't make it bigger than you have to or wider than you have to. Um, don't drive all over your lawn and pack it down, make it so it can still absorb water. Uh, avoid erosion from impervious surfaces and driveways. Channel the water away from the lake. Uh, I put in here the crown driveway using good gravel and rock or grass line drainage ditches. For us around the islands, that also applies a lot to all our private roads. We've got, we have an awful lot of private roads. I can't remember the mileage, it's almost as much as our town roads. So the more we can do to control that runoff is good. Um, same story with, with, if you've got culverts, allowing culverts and rock aprons to help slow the water flow. Infiltration trenches, pervious pavement. We don't need a lot of blacktop just to push everything off to the edge and try to reduce the amount of impervious surfaces. And along those ditches and swales, keep them vegetated so they slow the water down and they hold it back. Um, and along the lake shore, make sure you've got at least 15 feet of vegetation back from the lake to, to protect any kind of water that is running in that direction. Um, you don't need a huge lawn area. You can, Keep, keep a minimal lawn area. Obviously keep your pet waste out of the, out of the lake. Um, a, a big piece and, and kind of buried in some of Mark's numbers he just showed you is for developed lands, they find that, that fertilizers and pesticides and runoffs from, from developed lands on a per acre basis is, is much worse than what we do from a farming standpoint. So especially along the lake, if you, there's no need to fertilize your lawn. Um, Limit the number of pathways you have. So again, it limits the water flow. Um, instead, of, instead of mowing all over, have no mow zones, you know, plant, plant wildflowers everywhere. Um, there's the vegetation protection standards and, the, and lakeshore guides, follow those. Keep your lakeshore bank stable so it's not falling into the water and causing other problems. Um, and don't go filling in all your shallow water areas. Keep those shallow water areas actually help filter the water and, and keep it clean. And some of the, the small farm things that, that we should talk about and we do is only apply the nutrients when you need to. Um, take your soil samples. This is, you know, on the larger farms, they talk about their nutrient management plans where they measure, they measure exactly what the soil needs before they spread their manure so they know what they need to put onto it. Um, limit the discharges from the waste from the, from the farm. Use the collection systems, diversions, or runoff management techniques. Use good soil health with the cover cropping, the conservation tillage, the rotations, the grass waterways, the filter strips, 
and make sure you have plenty of buffers along the ditches and the surface waters. So those are things that we can do. There's also um, things we can do from, uh, let's see, I can't remember if I had that next page there or not. There, there's also things we can do in terms of forming groups. One is the LakeWise program where neighborhoods can get together and work together as to what you want within your area along the lake. Um, and that's in one of Molly's reference charges how to get to. So with that, Molly, why don't we move on? We'll work on the questions. I saw a lot of good questions here buried out there. Okay. All right. So I will start from some of the first questions that we received. Um, and Mark or Bob, feel free to answer it as, as you feel comfortable. Um, so we have a question. Um, first, there's a recommend recommendation to watch a documentary, Kiss the Ground, um, which focused on regenerative ag agriculture. Um, and the attendees wondering what can be done to put those practices into place in the islands to better protect the land and improve water quality. I haven't seen the video, so I'm not sure if the practices are different than the practices we already know about. Um, I think it's maybe best to focus on just what you know of regenerative agriculture. Um, I guess I'm, I'm happy to weigh in a little bit from what I understand, it's been a topic of conversation um, with the Citizens Advisory Committee for some time. And um, my sense is overall, regenerative agriculture is a focus on growing soil. And if you think about it, a farm field or your garden that you strip off the top, um, apply herbicides or pesticides, uh, plant and uh, uh, turnover often um, really doesn't develop a rich soil profile. And by growing a soil profile, which has always has vegetation, a diversity of, of um, vegetative cover on it, um, you increase its capacity for carbon sequestration, which is uh, building carbon back into the soil for holding back water and water absorption and infiltration. Um, I think there was a great example of it over at the old Sawyer Bay farm. Um, it is a uh, uh, health hero farm now. And um, early on, there was a remarkable study going on where for cattle grazing, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 to 20 different species were planted. And it had been fairly traditionally um, uh, practiced or practiced traditional agriculture. Um, crop rotation, annual plowing, planting, herbicide utilization, et cetera. And this stopped all, uh, all tillage and allowed intensive grazing for uh, diversity of species and included, I think, rutabaga and various nitrogen fixing uh, vegetation, et cetera, so that the cows would stomp in, root around, dig and chew and um, leave their droppings and move on to the next section. And I think Eric grew soil. Originally, he maybe had a one inch soil profile. If you ever dig into your lawn, you see you know, grass to depths of soil and the changing of color until you get to the base soil. I think Eric had, went from two inches to about eight inches of soil in just a few years. And that's dramatic. And that to me is the um, sort of a, a, the simplest example of the values and benefits of regenerative agricultural practice. 
Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm going to combine, there was a, a few questions about Roundup in particular. Um, so I'm gonna sort of combine a few of the questions. Um, someone says, we have a buckthorn issue here in the islands and um, glyphosate is the herbicide of choice. Um, so they're sort of re guest receiving mixed messages. Um, so what's the best action to take when, when something like that happens? Um, and then the second part of the question is, is it in, within Vermont's control to ban atrazine and glyphosate? Um, I, I can address those both. So I was just trying to find what bill, but a bill was introduced to ban chlor, chlorpyrifos, atrazine and glyphosate um, this session in the legislature. I can't find the bill offhand. Uh, I meant to highlight it, but if you were to search at the legislative uh, uh, website, it'll show up fairly quickly. So it is in there. It, um, it we do have that capacity. Um, second, um, glyphosate is if used correctly and provided exposure is absolutely minimized and there's no risk of it running off into the watershed, it is one of the only um, herbicides that effect that's effective at managing a lot of invasive species. I know both the European buckthorn and the Japanese knotweed, unless you literally dig them up and drag them away mechanically, um, the herbicide application is reasonably effective. Um, obviously mechanical would be preferred to not use pesticides or herbicides at all. Um, and another question similar, um, does, atro does atrazine persist in the water? Does it accumulate in fish? My understanding, it's not, uh, it, it does not persist for uh, as long a time as other chemicals of concern, nor does it have necessarily the same bioaccumulation um, of some of the other chemicals. It is a cancer hazard though. Okay. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, there's been a number of questions um, about the Burlington septic overflow um, and whether it's being addressed and how so and sort of the impacts that it's, you know, that the, the situation is having on our community surrounding wetlands and Lake Champlain. Um, if either of you have any sort of intimate knowledge of that, um, it seems to sort of be a hot button topic for sure. Um, <laughs> so Burlington is making some major investments in their system. One of the first things they've actually done is even when they have overflows now, they're actually treating that water as the overflows are going. So they're actually doing a lot of uh, treatment, even on the quote unquote untreated water. So it's better than it used to be. It's obviously still not good enough. Um, but they've done that first and they're still doing their major upgrade, uh, which is gonna take, I forgot what it is, is it two, three, four years? I don't remember the time frame. Maybe you remember, Mark. But, um. Um, yeah, they, they are, I, St. Albans Bay did some of theirs. Rutland you've probably seen has had a number of overflows. And you know, as Bob noted that um, this is a legacy problem. Back in the seventies, uh, there was a lot of focus. So first, Wastewater treatment plants didn't exist in the lake until the 50s or 60s. And some of you might remember that, who, who might be listening or, or participating in this. And so they were installed and, um, and then there were storm sewers that directly went into the lake. In the 70s, a lot of money was invested, federal money primarily, but including state money to combine those, thinking that we could treat them. And the problem is, is that with our increase of development lands and now with these really challenging climactic events, meaning extreme storms of enormous volumes, 
causing these massive surges into our systems, whether it's back roads or in developed lands. The capacity to hold that water back and treat it all doesn't exist. So while they're operational and functional, and as Bob noted, they're actually continuing to treat even the, the rainwater, the stormwater. The problem is, and it's the human health issues, when they have to just let them bypass. And it's remarkably expensive to build containment to hold that water back. And so while most municipalities are doing what they can, um, it's far more, uh, it's a much higher return on investment for us to be focusing on these pollutant and health, re health hazard reductions in other places as compared to the, as you noted, only three or 4% of the significant load going into the lake is wastewater treatment plants. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be focusing on it, but we, we aren't getting the bang for the buck um, by focusing on wastewater treatment plants. Okay, thanks. And there was, there was a question about um, what you meant by legacy load of phosphorus. Um, I don't know if you want to, I know you just talked a little bit about that. If you want to elaborate anymore, they just asked for a little bit of further explanation. Um, sure. As Vermont grew in population and in its utilization of the landscape and for development or for agriculture, um, particularly after World War II, after all of the quote unquote war machines, right, where this nation got together and um, produced enormous amounts of materials and chemicals in order to fund and, uh, and build uh, bombs, et cetera, for World War II. When that ended, those stranded assets, you might think about them, those phosphorus and nitrogen uh, factories were, weren't gonna be idled. And also technology at the time said, if you put more phosphorus and nitrogen onto your land, you increased yield. So part of the birth of industrial agriculture and a continuation of those war production factories, um, literally rail cars of phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizer were shipped very cheaply up into the North Country. And at the time, the Department of Agriculture and other uh, governmental state or federal institutions were really promoting spreading lots and lots of it into the ground. Well, we, we have high natural levels of phosphorus and we weren't monitoring it as we might have liked. And so there are literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of tons of um, that material loaded into sediments on the lake. And so it is in effect being processed within the lake ecosystem. And so while we're adding more to it now, the lake has too much in it. That's the legacy. It's already in sediments scattered throughout the lake. And so we're feeling the repercussions of that because naturally occurring in that legacy load gets turned over inside the lake and, and supports the algae blooms that are compounded by increased temperature and our continued loading from our present practices. I hope that helped. <laughs> I thought it was, it was a great explanation. It's, um, mostly it's just, it's, it's not just what we're doing today, it's what we've done in the past and why we have to work that much harder so that our kids have a healthy, thriving, swimmable, fishable, drinkable Lake Champlain. Um, you know, kicking the can down the road is not going to work. And that's why we're finally making such monstrous investments in this cleanup and why, as we noted, and as, as Bob shared, we all through our day-to-day -day practices can impact it because it's land use that impacts the lake. We have so much land area feeding into the lake compared to most other water bodies that um, we have the greatest opportunities for positively impacting if we change our behavior or negatively impacting if we keep doing the same old thing. I guess another part I would add that to Mark is the chemical composition of a lot of the legacy phosphorus is different than the new phosphorus that's going in. Right. Um, the 
a lot of that legacy is is almost in a stable mode where the where the where the weeds and and algae growth can't I can't use that that fertilizer per se for it. Um, so there's still, which is part of the reason why we're con we're concentrating on what's getting into the lake now, because it can be used faster by things that are in for the growth in the water. Um, so that's still the biggest impact is making sure we don't have more go in, and trying to go after that legacy is it's it doesn't all cause the problem. It's only that that top layer per se that's getting stirred around and used. Right, and and it, we get complicated lake chemistry. It's the ratio between total nitrogen and total phosphorus and those sediment levels that if we disrupt that ratio, um, it kicks the lake into a a bloom situation, a massive vegetation growth, or a massive die-off, depending on what happens. And um, like, as you noted, getting control of what's feeding in immediately is what's most important. Thank you guys. Um, and just to remind all the attendees um, to try to keep any questions to the Q&A section. And we definitely want to encourage discussion amongst each other, um, but if you could, put that in discussing discussions in the chat, questions um, in the Q&A, that would be super helpful. Um, but I will move on to the next set of questions. Um, do we know what percentage of the agricultural inputs of nutrients and chemicals are from tiles and how much from surface runoff and what programs exist to help or encourage farmers to reduce these loads? So the, well, let's see if I try to really understand the question there. The, the, the tiling is an interesting debate. They've, they've done a lot of studies. Um, from, a, from a tiling standpoint for our rapid rainfalls um, or large rainfalls in the rainstorms, the tiling actually helps because it gets it off the land before it can pick up a lot of the phosphorus that's, that's in the soil. You, you actually clear it off quicker. Um, and it's helpful that way. Uh, they are actually doing some more studies now where they're measuring actual, they're putting in monitors to actually measure outtakes of those, uh, uh, some of those tiles um, up in, uh, I can't remember if there's farms there, the Franklin County area. Um, so from a tiling standpoint, it actually helps reduce the phosphorus runoff because it gets the water out before it has time to absorb the phosphorus. Um, there's a second sort of question from someone else that also asks about tiling. Um, they're curious about the regulations for tiling fields and are retention ponds required or does this flow directly into the lake? Um, a retention, to have a retention pond large enough to deal with a, a runoff from a from one or two inch rainstorm the, the pond would have to be almost as big as the field. You can't, you, you can't make a retention pond large enough to contain all the water. So it's not really an option. Um, they do attempt to put it into a, a, a ditch in a form that it filters as it goes through the ditch. Again, you want grass lined or less steep and the, the same things we kind of talked about earlier to, to restrict the flow and not have it going too, too fast through, so it's not causing erosion per se. You just want the water out, but you don't want to cause erosion in the process. Hopefully that helps. Okay, and then um, another question about regulations for spreading manure on frozen ground. Um, what are the regulations um, and what constitutes a waiver for this practice? Uh, I'm not sure if I know all of them. There, there is a... First off, we have a date regulation, which I, I mark on my calendar so I know I'm following it. Um, so first off, there's a date before and after. You're not supposed to spread on frozen ground unless you have a specific waiver. And you get into a waiver when you're, you're in your, your, uh, um, your uh, holding tanks are overflowing, so you have no other choice. Um, but you, have, you do have to go to the state to get a waiver to, to spread during the, the improper times. There's also controls in terms of 
spreading based on whether a rainstorm is coming or not. You're not supposed to spread if it's gonna rain within the next two days. So it has time to actually soak in and absorb into the soils and, and be contained before any water comes along to wash it off. And that's not when it's frozen, but, but any, uh, any time. Thanks, Bob. Um, all right, next question. Um, I know there are many fewer dairy farms now than 20 years ago. What has the change been in, ac in actual acreage under cultivation for dairy and also number of cows during the same period? Um, I, I don't know the acreage. I was, in fact, I was kind of asking myself that the other day. What I do know at least what I believe is South Hero now has only two dairy farms in the town um, where, you know, even, even 20 years ago, I think we still had close to a dozen. Um, so the, the number of dairy farms has drastically gone down. The number of cows have gone down because those are, those, those are not, they didn't absorb all those cows into our leftover two farms. Um, the, people that are now farming, they've diversified. And if you look at a, a, a beef operation, they have less cows per acre than we ever had with a dairy cow per acre coverage, even though they're larger animals. Or if you're like me and you'd use sheep instead of cows. So the, the load on the land within South Hero, at least is much less than it was before from that standpoint. Right. State, statewide, my understanding, the most recent reports we saw was a, a decrease in acres under production, a dramatic increase in the number of cows, and also we're making more milk um, with, um, but there, well, there's been an increase in cows, but we are making more milk with fewer cows than ever before. So I think we've sort of maximized our production of milk um, with more cows in confined areas and then slightly less uh, acres under cultivation for feed statewide. Yeah, for, right, from a with, statewide. With, you know, we only have 600 and I think the last report I saw was 630 dairy farms um, after some collapse or buyouts in, in, um, 2020, and you know, that's a pretty dramatic drop from from uh, even 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm trying. It almost seems like we lost like 100. I think we lost 100 dairy farms last year, if I remember the number. Maybe, maybe Roger can pipe in if he knows. Um, so, yeah, so they've gotten concentrated in other places. The, the The output of cow has gone up. The number of cows have gone down. The number of farms have drastically gone down. Um, but especially in the islands, the numbers have, have gone yeah. much. We're, we're close to non-existent in the county. Okay, we're going to switch gears here just a little. And I, I'm trying to kind of have some organization to the questions, but there may be a little bounce around, so I apologize. Um, so a question is when we talk about water quality, that also includes the increased vegetative growth that is taking over our water bodies. What is being done on this front? For example, overgrowth that is taking over sandbars, beaches. We talk a lot about source mitigation, but I'm concerned with the current quality of Keeler Bay. Uh, Keeler Bay is your study, Molly. That's why you want to do it. <laughs> um, yes, we are definitely focusing the study on the Keeler Bay shorelines, but less so about um, vegetative growth. Um, sort of from what I've learned um, is that a decrease in phosphorus loading into that area won't necessarily result in a decrease of um, weed growth or invasive species growth, um, which um, we were, which some thought would would resolve that. Um, I think a lot of the invasive species in that area, in particular, um, I mean, it can change seasonally and yearly, um, but unfortunately, a lot of like the the Eurasian millfowl that have sort of 
dug themselves into the water are unfortunately here to stay and to and to eradicate them completely um it just may not be possible there are definitely ways to reduce it um there's mechanical harvesting but there are downsides to that um and that it could kind of it can stir up more of the vegetative growth um and so sometimes the best sort of long-term sustainable plan is education and outreach. So preventing more invasive species from congregating in the lake um, by having, you know, stewards at boat launch sites or public access sites. Um, so there, there is stuff can be done, but the, I would say the majority of funding you can get for that, they're looking for more long-term solutions than just sort of pulling up the weeds um, and the growth um, because they will likely come back. Um, but yeah, we know that that is definitely an issue in Keeler Bay. Um, and it is sort of on our radar um, to just talk about it more with what we can, how we can work with the community to get better, better, better educated um, about different um, tactics that can be used. That's my answer to it. Um, but yeah, I can follow up with more information. So I'll follow up from our meeting regarding that. Um, okay, I'll we'll move on to another question. Um, could any of you comment on how climate change is projected to impact the lake? For example, are there projections of lake levels? For Great Lakes, the hydro models are not well coupled to the climate models. So it's hard to project lake, le lake level. But there might also there might be other impacts from changes in ice cover, limitations on invasives, et cetera. Um, don't know how well it's been studied. Um, I can answer a part of that. I, I think um, one of the best places there actually is a lake level control studies and climate change impacts on Lake Champlain, given the floods of 2011 with Tropical Storm Irene and the really horrible downstream floods on the Richelieu. Um, and so that triggered a lot of public outcry to look at is there, are there ways to manage the lake levels and manage flows? Um, if you look at the International Joint Commission study, and I think uh, we could probably add a link to that uh, later after we, after we um, update perhaps the resources, there's a study going on now. Um, what I understand is that um, at least as Lake Champlain is concerned, and you're right that the Great Lakes are such vast water bodies that um, their fluctuations over the last 20 or 30 or more years, and I grew up in Detroit on the Great Lakes, um, it, it's been really hard for them to get a projected handle on um, and, uh, and manage those flows especially when Great Lakes flow management is by the a dam on the St. Lawrence, primarily for Lake Ontario. Um, and essentially one single dam, the Ross Dam up there at Cornwall. So in Vermont, there is no meaningful lake level impacts from any climate models that I've seen. Um, there may be some flow issues downstream causing flooding but our primary impacts in the basin will be to the tributaries from developed lands and impacts from um, agriculture lands, um, not really lake level issues. Anything we see will be negligible. And as you know, that in the last 10 years, we've seen our typical 10 year fluctuation in lake level from 103, the peak of 2011, down to right around 94 this year. Um, whether we see it even lower and see some very low levels in the next year or two, um, you know, the lowest recorded I think is 92.6 or 0.7. Um, and, you know, we're getting close to that. And if we have another dry year, we might get down to that. So you'll see all of the sandbar maybe on both sides exposed um, if we get to 92.7. And that hasn't happened since uh, early 1900s, 07, 08, 09, I think were, were a series of very low droughty conditions.
Um, and I'll add that one of the resources that we per, will be sending out after um, has a really in-depth analysis of climate change and the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, so I think it'd be a great resource if you're interested in sort of long-term impacts on the lake um, to spend some time reviewing. Okay. Um, question. I learned recently that testing at the now closed South Hero dump has continued over the years to reveal high levels of PFAs. Is there a plan in place to mitigate this toxic situation and, and its impact on the health of our community, the surrounding wetlands and Lake Champlain? Bob, I don't know if you have a awareness of the history of the dump and testing there. I know that um, after the um, single main inst incident down in Southern Vermont um, and the continued work there that the DEC and Matt Campbell um, are really taking a lead uh, nationwide. Um, Vermont has taken a lead on really investigating PFAS and related chemicals. I know that they came up and tested one of the wire factories up here and maybe another location that they were uh, had some previous information about to uh, be sure that there wasn't any spreading. I don't know if the dump was on that list. It's probably ready of it readily available on the DEC website as part of their PFAS response. Um, but uh, as far as I'm aware, there wasn't any migration and um, I'm, I'm not that aware of specific testing going on at the, at the old uh, dump sites. I think there's two, one by White Speech and the other one up off Dubuque Lane, right, Bob? Isn't that where the two yeah. dumps were? Yeah, th yeah, those are the only two. And, and I thought the reason that, uh, I may be wrong, I thought the reason that the select board decided to stop testing the one on Dubuque Lane was the they were not seeing any problems and they had seen it, it it's I forgot how many years it's been now it's, it's been quite a while and I I didn't think there was any leakage I didn't think they were getting any pollution and it was fairly confident that they didn't need to test there anymore because of because there was no problems um so to, uh, I'm I guess I'm confused to say that they'd actually seen results there that that were a problem And I've never seen any of the results from the from the uh, West Shore Road testing sites. So I'm assuming if there are problems there, we we would have closed the beach by now. Um, there's a comment in the chat um, that there's info about the testing at the dump it is recent, and it was in recent minutes of the select board. Um, so that's something that we can we can look into um, after the meeting. Um, and circulate it around. Um. Yeah, I just want to mention too, um, I think I just saw a chat from uh, Jack. You know, Jack, thank you for your question. Sorry, we, we weren't able to get to all of them. And I know you got to go, but um, uh, we will be following up with questions. So if we don't get to anyone's questions today, we'll definitely follow up afterwards um, with you. We'll be sending out some emails and we can contact you guys individually too. We'll, we'll keep on going if, you know, if folks want to, but uh, we can also, whatever we don't get to, we'll, we, we can definitely follow up. So thanks everyone for your question. Okay, um, so we just got a question a few minutes ago. So I'll send this one out. Do the public water systems adequately filter our drinking water for it to be safe, include safe from chemicals that run into the lake? If not, what should we do in our own homes to have safe or safer drinking water? I can tell you the the, the town, the, the South Hero, I forget the name of all the different water districts. The one off the end of Hill Road is following all the state standards. They test it multiple times a week. They're, they're supposedly following all the right guidelines. So you, your water coming in should be fine. Yeah, I mean, the, the one of the misconceptions about so much of our systems starting with when we flush is that somehow 
wherever the flush is going is going to take care of everything that we put down there, which is why uh, they, we have drives to not flush your pharmaceuticals or other chemicals into your septic systems or down wastewater treatment plants because they aren't designed. They biologically filter. Um, they try to remove suspended solids, which might have some chemicals on it, but they're not really removing chemicals. And that's why we find that caffeine is at the discharge or, um, or uh, birth control uh, estrogens are in, in discharge waters. Um, and those are not absolutely filtered out into our drinking water that comes from the lake either. Um, ha if you're concerned about safety, I mean, as Bob said, drinking water from the lake is about as safe as any water you're gonna get. Um, there's no chemicals of concern at a level of any concern. Um, but putting an extra filter on, um, pouring it through the various uh, uh, you know, aftermarket things that are there if you're really concerned, but you know, buying bottled water and, and those as a solution to not drinking properly treated municipal water, whether it's a fire district or Champlain water district, um, is, a, is a not helping because most of that water is tap water anyway and uh, exacerbating the problem. Um, we should be funding our, our, um, our water supply and wastewater disposal facilities better so they can uh, have better equipment and uh, better utilization. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I just wanted to share a comment we got from Roger Rainville. Um, it sort of goes back to some of the a few earlier questions um, that it takes 100 to 500 years to produce one inch of topsoil and adding in different plant species helps build organic matter in soil, thus building a better soil profile. So a little- yeah, that's, that's the regenerative agriculture. All right, we're getting low on questions. Let me just kind of scroll through. Um, we have a question about data collection. Um, this is probably referencing your presentation, Mark, um, and if they have volunteer crews helping um, to collect water quality data. Uh, they do. We, um, we, we'll add that too, but the lay monitoring, pro lay monitoring program is a uh, contributor to the long-term monitoring program. And there are opportunities for citizens to be citizen scientists and participate in that long-term monitoring. Um, and there are lots of avenues to join that uh, tribe of folks who are really out there uh, on the front lines collecting that data. So um, if, if you go to the long-term monitoring program at DEC, they have a uh, link to the lay monitoring program and opportunities for um, that volunteer science work. Great, I think there were some, a few questions in the pre-event survey that were asking about volunteer opportunities. So we will definitely send around that resource too. Um, right. Lake Champlain Committee is a great resource too. They are very active in the in the in monitoring programs, specifically around the cyanobacteria, but also supporting the lay monitoring. So, um, going to Lake Champlain Committee, and uh, I think I saw Gary was on the attendance list. Reach out to Gary too. I think he might still be chair of their board. Um, our neighbor Gary Jellerin down on uh, Lakeview Road. Do you think we have time for a few more questions? I mean, yeah, I'm I'm flexible as long as as long as you all are. Um, I know some folks have left. But we still have a good we still have a good crowd here. Um, so I'm down to answer a few more. I mean, I'm I've got the easy job. I'm just here hanging out. So you know, I'm just here to I'm just here to learn. All right. Well, then let's let's keep going. Um, we have a question about fallen tree leaves and how and if it's detrimental to throw in say three to four bags of leaves into the lake each year. 
and don't do it. <laughs> Lake, Lake um, doesn't need anything more loaded into it. Put it in your mulch it and put it in your in your uh, garden or in your uh, in the woods or mulch them on top of your lawn. Sorry. I see, a, I see a question on public perception surrounding actual effects of wastewater overflows. Did, Molly, did you send that? Oh, Mike Wickenden. Sorry. Yes, that is one of the questions. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, Mike, yeah, I think you're right. I think that um, it hits the news whenever there's a, a stormwater overflow event, a CSO event at, at any of the sites, at least they're required to report it. They used to not even have to require report it or they could take 24 hours. It's immediate now. And it's also immediate on, on the New York side. Um, and that's important for the human health issues. Is it swimmable? Um, is it drinkable? Are there any direct human health impacts? Um, but the, the basic point is, is that they, it is nominal pollution loading um, uh, from those CSO events um, relative to when there are functioning systems or relative to other land use from stormwater runoff off roads and ditches or from agricultural runoff. Um, that's a, a, a stream bank erosion. And all of it leads to uh, the solutions of slowing down water from runoff, collecting it, impounding it, providing infiltration or uh, as Bob noted, uh, you know, vegetative swales that actually will utilize and uh, uh, pull out some of the nutrients for the vegetative growth and prevent it from reaching the lake. Molly, you're muted. Thank you. Um, is there, on the islands, is there a safe way to draw water from the lake for drinking? Sure, with a permit from the state to uh, have a have a uh, potable water supply. Um, I think they're still allowing it and with proper pumps and filters. And personally, I'd rather drink lake water than the smelly sulfur horrible water that, you know, you've got a complicated chlorine and aeration and other filtration system to be able to drink that I know so many people struggle with in the Lake Champlain Basin, not just in the islands, but throughout. So, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of water supply systems that are being fed by the lake. I think nearly 300,000 people in the basin drink from Lake Champlain. Okay, getting down to the last of our questions. Um, are zebra mussels still a problem in the lake, um, specifically Outer Mallets Bay? Yes. Zebra mussels are not going away. The quagga mussel, the, the, the biggest impact um, right now, um, we've seemed to have been able to manage them um, water intake structures are challenged and need to be cleaned almost annually now. Um, some of the bigger ones probably biannually. Um, but I understand that the uh, uh, underwater archeological preserve, so the shipwrecks that are managed by the Maritime Museum down in Panton um, and for the State Historical Society, that a lot of those wrecks are starting to fall apart because, and, and Mike Wickenden might be able to weigh in, he's a diver, um, are starting to fall apart because of the weight of the biomass of all of those zebra mussels attached to them. And then I think there's another, the quagga mussel, um, that is another invasive, invasive of concern, um, but not, it's, it's not nearly as prolific um, as uh, zebra mussel. Oh, 
All right, that actually finishes up our question. We have just one of a comment that I'll read out loud in the in the Q&A section um, that the water district send everyone an EPA mandated annual report on what has been detected in the water. Um, and we, you may be able to find those on the web. Um, so just wanted to share that comment from one of our attendees. Oh, and I'm sorry, thank you, Guy. Um, there was another question earlier in the chat. Um, sorry, give me a second to scroll up. Yeah, no worries. I think that person actually might have left. So oh. I just want to let you, yeah, we, we might want to follow up with them um, over email. We can absolutely do that. But yeah, uh, they're, they're just asking about potential grad student projects, I think, for water quality. So, um, so yeah, and so we'll also we are recording this, so we will post it online um, on YouTube in the next few days. So if you had to leave early or or if you missed the beginning, um, there, that would be available. And like Malik said, we'll be sending out the slides um, and t t like tons of good resources too. So, uh, and feel free to follow up with us too with with, with, with other questions you may have. Um, we'll include our emails in the follow-up so you can reach out to all of us um, if you have any more questions. We got one last quick question. I think it, we should be able to answer it quickly. Um, if anyone can speak to the safety of swimming in the lake. <laughs> Dive in. The water, the water's fine today. I, I go swimming every chance I get. You know, except when there's obvious um, cyanobacteria blooms, which there's potential real impacts, right? There's people that have significant reactions to it. I wouldn't dive into it when it's pea green soup, but any other time I wouldn't hesitate. And as cold as you can stand. Yeah, and you can you can check those online too. I, I usually know when I go swimming, I look for, I can't remember what the website is. I usually Google, you know, Lake Champlain beach reports and you can you can see where there's been recent blooms and you can sort of say, oh, is, you know, is it gonna look good here? And then you can go to White's Beach or you can go to the sandbar or wherever, you know, cause you can sort of track those and those, and I think those are those volunteers again, right? Mark, those are the, the volunteers that do keep track of those. Yeah, both the state and LCC, I think I heard are working on a uh, very timely interactive uh, beach reporting uh, site and possibly an app connected to it that, um, you know, really will give you real time data on on the swim ability or fish ability of various spots around the lake. Well, I think that's a very positive note to sort of wrap up the meeting. We can <laughs> sort of go to bed and dream about warmer days for when we actually can go swimming in the lake and it's not a, a sheet of ice. <laughs> and and uh, I think we'll share contact info. I'm, I can't remember whether it was already on the slides. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions digitally, et cetera, or refer you. There is so much good information out there. All, all of the organizations are doing a fantastic job of uh, making their uh, information available and also making it uh, easier to digest the, the density of some of the information. I know I shared a lot of fairly dense stuff. Um, and I, uh, if I couldn't answer it, I can direct you to a place where you can uh, dig in more deeply and I'm happy to do so. Well, awesome. You know, I just wanna say from uh, South Carolina Trust on behalf of the Worthen Library, you know, thank you all. Th thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much, Molly and Bob for taking the time to be able to talk with us and get these discussions going. We really appreciate you all um, spending your time being able to help you know, have to, um, these important discussions. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. And we hope that this can be the first, you know, in, in, in you know, like more conversations. I think part of the goal for this webinar series is to, you know, foster dialogue around some important issues um, that, you know, that, that the islands um, have today. So thank you all. We look forward to having more conversations and uh, working together to clean up the lake. So yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, thanks. Be well, everyone.